I'd like you all to imagine for a second that you have a child with a disease so uncommon that no one you know has ever heard of it. And maybe there's only two or three physicians in the world that not only cannot pronounce the disease, but actually know something to do about it. So I'm a clinical geneticist at Children's National. We deal with about 7,000 conditions just like this. We call them rare diseases. Some of them are as common as one in several million, some one in 50,000. We have to figure out how to treat these patients. We have to figure out how, what to do for them. Sam's a great example, and we're gonna show you another one today. This could get overwhelming, this many conditions to deal with. But what if someone had come up with a way to use the cells and the biology of the patients themselves to teach us how to treat them? So I'm going to tell you a story about Stacy. Stacy's not her real name. What I can tell you, this is a beautiful young girl whose smile can light up a city. Stacy has one of these rare diseases we work with. It's called propionic acidemia. That's a defect in the enzyme propionyl-CoA carboxylase, which there will be a quiz after the talk today. <laughs> I expect you all to remember that. Uh, Stacy, we've been following since birth. This is one of the conditions we do newborn screening for. And Stacy's condition is really, really, really tough to work with. I do not expect you to share my enthusiasm for a biochemical wall chart. <laughs> this will be part of the quiz, though. But the key to taking care of Stacy lies within this chart. This is the interactions between all the complex biomolecules that go on inside the cell every day in every single one of us in this audience. But trying to parse that out, trying to look at this in a living patient, is almost impossible to do. So I'll use the Tokyo subway system instead <laughs> as my analogy. Um, the Tokyo subway system is almost as complex as a biochemical wall chart, but 15 million people travel it every single day. But what happens if a train goes off the track? What if the computer that controls the train says, ooh, this isn't going to work today? What happens? Well, everything else tends to shut down and there are ripple effects. In these biochemical diseases, we see the same thing. When one train goes genetically off the track, like propionic acidemia, it slows down and affects the rest of the system. So, Stacy has one of these conditions. Her train is propionic acidemia. How do we treat that? Well, we can screen for it in the newborn period. Once upon a time, all of our patients died with this in the newborn period. With newborn screening, we can actually recognize these kids and we can treat them. So Stacy has to drink a formula that tastes a little bit like chalk dust mixed with motor oil. Um, yeah, don't want to try that. The other thing is Stacy has to come in and out of the hospital because her liver can just barely manage to keep up with the protein and things coming in. So she always builds up ammonia and other compounds to the point which to actually stabilize her so that we can keep her healthy, going to school and things, we have to do a liver transplant. So Stacy's actually had a liver transplant for this. That's the way to keep her alive. But it's not a fix. The biochemical disorder she has is in all of her cells. And Stacy's life expectancy may not go past her 20s. Um, so what we're trying to figure out is how do we do something for her? How do we fix this? Was well, it turns out when we transplant Stacy's liver, normally we take that liver from Stacy and we throw it in the bucket. It's gone. But what if we could actually use that liver to figure out how to treat her? So as Marshall said, Stacy has a disease called propionic acidemia. It's actually one of several diseases like it called organic acidemias. Uh, and all of us sitting in the audience, when we eat a meal and it gets broken down into protein and then amino acids, it ends up in a molecule called propionyl-CoA. And then there's an enzyme in our liver that turns it into energy. And that's what we do day to day, and that's how, how we live. We call that homeostasis. It's a little bit different for Stacy though. She has a single point mutation in that gene that takes propionyl-CoA and turns it into the energy that we use. And that mutation causes the buildup of literally acid in her blood. We call it propionic acid. That propionic acid very early in life will start to cause neurological disorders. And then even with a liver transplant, she probably won't live to be the age of 25 because she's going to die from heart failure. So why is this disease so hard to study? Why is it so hard to find a therapy for her? You may or may not know this, but the mouse is often our human drug discovery tool. The mouse is a human drug discovery tool. Yes, mice have livers, 
And yes, we can create a genetic mutation in them to mimic a disease, but with a disease like Stacy's and other kids like hers, when these mice are born, they die immediately at birth. And I think it's fair to say that Stacy's not a mouse. No. Nope. I'm not a mouse. You're not a mouse. I don't see any mice in the audience. Okay? Humans are not mice, but this is the tool we turn to. Marshall told you earlier, though, that at some point, Stacy's going to have to have a liver transplant. Can we do something with that liver to learn a little bit more about her disease? You may, a little show and tell, you may remember this from high school biology. This is a Petri dish. It's a pretty cool piece of plastic. We can take Stacy Stells from her liver, and we can put them in a Petri dish. I think we all agree that this is not a mouse. But Stacy Cells in this Petri dish, is that really her rare liver disease? I don't think so. In fact, when you take liver cells and a lot of different cell types and you put them in a plastic dish like this, they start to flatten out and become like skin cells or fibroblasts. And they basically lose their function. So what we needed was a way to get to the headwaters of this disease. We needed a way to actually look at what was going on inside Stacy cells and other kids like her at the molecular level at the deepest dive. We've never been able to do that before. If we can do that, that gives us a place to poke, prod, see if we can find a metaphorical lever to actually move her disease so that she's actually safe. The challenge is that the liver, it's pretty complex. Um, this is an image from Encyclopedia Britannica, so it's dumbed down a little bit compared to what our liver looks like. But think about the liver as like the human pool filter. It's detoxifying our blood, but it's also creating energy for us. Uh, there's tubes coming in and out of it called blood vessels. And then there's all these cell types that carry out this orchestrated symphony to maintain balance in us. What if you could recreate that outside of the human body? What if you didn't have to use a Petri dish? Because that's not a Petri dish, what you see on the screen. What I want to show you is a technology that can literally recreate a person's disease, a liver disease, a rare liver disease, in the laboratory. Behind this little box here is a motor, and I want you to think of that as the heart. Okay? It turns out that blood flow is key for these cells to wake up. This heart is pumping, it's pulsating, just like in the liver. And when we expose that to the patient's cells, which are down here, they wake up and they think they're back home. So something happened special last July. We'd been waiting to get a liver for Stacy for some time, and one was finally available. Um, think of trying to plan a royal wedding with two hours' notice. We had to get a team pulled together from four states, five institutions, <laughs> Um, of course, it always happens on Friday night. There's an unwritten rule about that. Um, we pulled everyone together. We were able to get Stacy's liver, get the cells isolated, and get them turned over to Hemashear in time while the cells were still alive and viable we could work with. That was a, it was a pretty amazing event. Friday, Stacy goes up for a transplant. She gets her liver. We get the new liver. All the way through Saturday and Sunday, a team of biomedical engineers, scientists, biologists, working tirelessly around the clock to recreate her disease in the laboratory 30 times over. I remember sending Marshall a picture very similar to this on Sunday, and he texted me back. He said, he said, hey, Brian, today we made history. We recreated a person's disease in the laboratory. And, you know, when you look at this, you're like, that's science fiction. Let me tell you, it's not science fiction. Last Wednesday, it happened again. We had another patient with the same disease, up for a transplant, her liver comes to Hemoshare, and we did it one more time. So what does this mean for Stacy? What this means now is we can look at her liver cells and we can say, do they behave like they do in the disease state? If we feed those cells the same thing that Stacy would eat, are we gonna see the same reactions? Are we gonna see the same biomolecules produced that will reproduce the disease so we can actually really study it in this system? You know the answer to that. What you see over here, actually be your left side, is what cells look like in an intact liver. If we take those cells out of an intact liver now and we put them in a Petri dish, they're doing what we said earlier, they're flattening out. Now we take those same cells and we put them in the technology and they've woken back up. They look like they're back in the human liver. 
But remember, Stacy's liver is sick, right? And they sell shouldn't look healthy. There's got to be something wrong with them. Well, it turns out that when we took those cells and we put them on the same diet that would make Marshall's patients sick, they started to make acid, just like they would in her. And for the first time, we had a disease model that we can play with. So Marshall, what does this mean for Stacy? What does this mean for your patients? Well, what this means is we can cut literally years off of the development for new treatments for our patients. Before, we would have to try to develop an animal model that would work that often wouldn't work. Or we'd try serendipity. We'd try to find maybe here's a drug that would work here or there. Now we can take a systematic approach to developing new therapies for these patients. This literally is an order of magnitude improvement on what we're going to be able to do. And it actually offers us, for the first time, hope for developing therapies rapidly for these patients with rare diseases so we can tackle the other 6,999 of them. <laughs> Imagine that, right? Stacy and other children like her, they take her liver and they throw it away. That liver is now being used to develop a therapy for her. And, and for other rare diseases, what you see here, we can create rare diseases of blood vessels, rare cancers. We can even go after more global diseases like fatty liver disease that impacts the world. But, you know, first things first, Marshall. Stacy, your patients and patients like her. Yeah. And just to let you know, Stacy's doing great after her transplant. She's at home, happy and healthy right now. Thank you.